room this morning. Come on, church. To you, we will come running in you. We find the glory in your love. It's all that can satisfy to you. To you, we will come running in you. We find the glory in your love. It's all that can satisfy. we thank you that you inhabit the praises of your people. God, and we thank you that you are in this place today. We thank you that you come alive when we sing your praises, Father God. We pray that you would just come and have your way in this place, Father God. Come and have our way in our lives. We commit this service and this day to you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would meet each one in a special way this morning. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you. We're going to continue in worship this morning. And as we do, I'm going to invite the prayer team forward. If you have a need this morning, we want to welcome you to come forward. The prayer team would love to pray with you.
you just close your eyes for a minute. You know, as we're in this atmosphere of worship, there should be an element of our worship that's vulnerable. Sure, we come into, the Bible says, his courts with praise. We enter in with thanksgiving. But it's in the time of worship that that vulnerability is to take place. You know, if you come into your home on a cold day, you begin to undo, you take off your coat, you take off your gloves, your scarf, whatever. There's an element of being comfortable. That when you come into God's presence, that his presence has the ability to undo you. It's a place of vulnerability. It's a place of comfort. It's so critical in our worship that that takes place so that you can receive from the Lord. If not, there'll be like a level almost like resistance and it prohibits you from receiving what the Lord wants to do in your life. And you just take a minute, just in the quietness of the worship team playing in the background, would you just be vulnerable with the Lord in your, in your worship today? Would you just tell him what's going on? The Bible says, cast your cares on him, for he cares for us. Lord, we come into this place.
for your presence that's here with us today. But over the next few minutes, what I pray you would open our ears to what your spirit wants to speak to us, open our hearts to receive that. Lord, we didn't come today just to go through the motions. Lord, we didn't come just to be challenged on an intellectual level. But Lord, our heart's desire is that you challenge, that you encourage, that you would equip us with your Holy Spirit today, that your word would become alive, that it would be real, become relevant to us today. We just thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. I pray for just an openness today a special way to what you want to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You want to share something? The Spirit of the Lord is in this place. And he says, you should disarm. Disarm, disarm, disarm. Because the enemy wants you to hold on to your burdens. It is a spiritual battle to disarm. Surrender to the presence of the Spirit. you just received that today as a word from the Lord that you need to disarm just to position yourself in a sign of surrender you can do that by raising your hands it's not necessarily something that's physical as much as it is the posture of your spirit today Lord that we disarm Lord we want to receive from you today Lord we don't want to carry things that you never intended us to carry we want to surrender those things to you so that we can walk in freedom, walk in the peace of God, having a sound mind, anxious about nothing, because we pray about everything and we submit to you in all areas of our lives. Yes, Lord, you just received that today. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hope you didn't come to go through a routine, okay? Anybody come for a routine? This probably isn't going to be the best fit for you. We'd love to have you, but gosh, I want to create a culture and an atmosphere that respects the presence of the Lord. If not, I'm just going to get up and talk about the Bible and our hearts aren't ready to receive that. So we need to allow time. Why don't you take a minute and say hello to somebody that's by you this morning. Find your way and meet somebody that you haven't met before.
you may be seated. As you find your seat this morning, if you're a middle schooler, you guys are going to be dismissed at this time. Your life group's going to be meeting uh, in the foyer today. So middle schoolers, you guys can head out. As our ushers begin to make their way forward this morning, we want to take time and welcome those of you that are first-time guests with us at Access today. If you're a first-time guest, thank you for being here, taking some time out of your weekend to join us. As they make their way back uh, this morning, if you can just uh, raise a hand real quick, we want to give you a gift bag, and they'll put that in your hand, and uh, we appreciate it. Let's go ahead and give it up for our guests. If you could just raise your hand as they walk back, and uh, with that bag is a card that says connecting with you, and if you can take some time and begin to fill that out uh, during our service, you can drop that off in a few moments in our offering. It's a great opportunity for us to connect with you. We just have a gift that we'd like to send you this week in the mail. And then if you have any questions related to ministry and age-specific ministry and so forth, you can notate that on the card, and one of our leaders will contact you uh, this uh, upcoming week. But you can drop that off in the offering in a few moments. Our ushers are going to begin to make their way back, and they'll begin to distribute our worship registers. We just appreciate you. Uh, taking time each week to do that as those are being passed down the aisle, and then you can drop them off on the floor at the end. On the reverse side of that card in the worship registers is a prayer card. If you would like our team to be praying with you about something specific that's going on in your life, they'll be praying this week and joining with you uh, throughout the week in prayer, and you can drop that off in a few moments in the offering uh, as well. So thank you for that. By way of announcements, a couple updates we want to make sure you're aware of. Uh, this upcoming Tuesday... At 6 p.m. is our annual uh, ministry celebration. It's going to be right here at the school in the cafeteria. And so if you'd like to come, we'd love to have you. Uh, me and the leadership team will be hosting that. And uh, we'll be talking about a financial report. We'll be sharing a video with you guys. And we'll just have a great time. So that's this Tuesday evening at 6 o'clock. And uh, speaking of the school, we had, I think it was over 20 people uh, yesterday here for the Run for God. And they're going to be doing that this spring. There's uh, 20 or so plus of you doing that. If you would like to jump in and, and participate in that, there's a table in the foyer that you can check out, and we'd love to have you uh, participate that uh, in the 12 weeks. And I know, you know, we had everything from experienced runners to first-time runners, and so it's a great opportunity for you to connect throughout the week. And then we'll be sharing with you in two weeks a, another life group that's going to be starting up this spring. I'm really, really excited for that. Gene Galliano is going to be leading that, and uh, we'll share some more information uh, related to that life group. And then next week, uh, we'll update you. We're going to be having um, an Addiction Sunday focus coming up in, in the next couple weeks. You'll see that information in your program. But we have a guest speaker that's going to be with us following service. We're going to have a luncheon, just a simple lunch in the cafeteria, talking about addiction and awareness of some of the things that are going on in our community. And our community engagement team has just been such a blessing to us. And they've kind of taken initiative with this to coordinate it. But uh, save the date. We'll provide some more information about that next week. Uh, Mark Fraley will share that. But really looking forward to that and, and a way for you to connect and, and uh, focus on addiction and so forth in our community. Especially those of you that have teenagers and children. It would be a great opportunity for you to be there uh, that day. Our shoes are going to come this morning as we receive our offering. Appreciate your generosity last week, especially as you left. And many of you gave towards uh, the outreach in India coming up. So thank you for that. And Jim's going to pray this morning. God bless. Good morning, everyone. Mm, what a morning. Wow, what an atmosphere. You know, late yesterday afternoon, my wife and I drove through State College and saw a lot of people with green shirts on. And my suspicion is there's a lot of people this morning that are having maybe a green feeling in their face this morning. So, so contrast to what we've just experience and will continue to experience. So we just thank you, Lord. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your love, for your grace. Uh, we just thank you, Lord, for the blessings you give us every day. We thank you for this offering and just ask, Lord, that it be used to expand your kingdom in a mighty and powerful way. And Lord, just thank you, Lord, for, for all of that. We just love you and we ask this in Jesus' name.
Surrender all my life to your control. And you call me to deeper waters. You say, don't be afraid to trust where you will lead and walk on ways with you. And though I hear the thunder, you say, just have faith. To trust where you Great job, guys. That was really good. Got a keyboard player, we got a guitar player, and a, and a box player. <laughs> hey, it's on. <laughs> Whoever came up with the cahoon is one rich man. Let's get a couple pieces of wood, make a drum out of it. <laughs> Everybody having a good weekend so far? Turned 35, and I try not to talk about myself too much, but uh, had a great birthday weekend. And uh, my wife coordinated a couple's massage, and then I took a break from our eating plan and had Duncan, Dairy Queen, Texas Roadhouse, uh, what's that place downtown, hmm? Waffle Shop, and... Uh, let me just say, I'm, I'm feeling f both flexible and fat this morning, so <laughs> pray for me, and no. Anyway, great, great weekend, and uh, appreciate Nate Pimento being with us last weekend. I know many of you guys uh, mentioned your appreciation for him being with us, and had a great time. 
Uh, over the next couple weeks, we're going to be, we wrapped up a teaching series a couple weeks ago. We're going to be jumping into a new subject for the next several weeks on the subject of the kingdom. And uh, I had somebody a while back, and I had been kind of stewing over a teaching series related to the kingdom, and had somebody asked me one time on a, on a Sunday as they were leaving, they say, you know, I hear a lot about the kingdom. And they said, what's, what's the kingdom? So... I thought, you know what, now's the time to jump into this series. I'm really looking forward to talking about this over the next few weeks. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Luke, chapter 17, beginning in verses 20 through 22. And this will be uh, more of a foundational teaching on the subject of the kingdom. And then we're going to build on this over the next uh, couple weeks. So these messages will link together. Um, so if you're not here for a week, you can always catch up online. And uh, we want to welcome those that are on Facebook watching as well this morning. Thanks for being with us. Let's stand. Luke chapter 17, verses 20 through 22. We're going to read from the NIV, and then we'll read from the message translation as well. Uh, once, on being asked by the Pharisees, here's the question, when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. That's a key word, observed. Nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. The word midst is another key word here. Then he said to the disciples, a time is coming when you will long to see the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. Uh, reading from the message translation, Jesus Grilled by the Pharisees on when the kingdom of God would come, he answered, The kingdom of God doesn't come by counting the days on the calendar, nor when someone says, Look here, or there it is, and why? Because God's kingdom is already among you. He went on to say to his disciples, The days are coming when you are going to be desperately homesick for just a glimpse of one of the days of the Son of Man, and you won't see a thing. Lord, we thank you for your word today. Lord, I pray over the next couple of weeks as we talk about the subject of the kingdom, Lord, we wouldn't be intrigued by studying the kingdom in the Bible, that we wouldn't be fascinated on the kingdom that will come, but that we will live a kingdom mindset today. Lord, I pray you would open our hearts to receive your word today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to build off of this series or this message over the next couple of weeks, but the context of this key question that the Pharisees asked Jesus, it's in Passover season. In essence, it's a party, party time. There was an exciting atmosphere of, of expectancy that had pervaded the Jewish people. The Passover was when um, the Jews commemorated their deliverance from Egypt, when they had been set free from slavery by their great leader Moses. And ever since that time, the Jews had longed for another Moses and especially at this time in their history, they longed for someone who would deliver them from the present bondage of the Roman occupiers. They had hoped that John the Baptist would have been their deliverer, but he was, not, he was imprisoned and then killed. And so there's much attention that's focused on the Jewish people at this particular time. And unlike John, uh, who was able to, uh, Jesus is now able to work incredible miracles and to teach some very fascinating teachings that they're listening to. In fact, Jesus is going to Jerusalem and they're very excited all the more. And perhaps now they think that this Jesus would perhaps establish the promised kingdom of God. And so the key verse here is in verse 20. And it was the custom for Jewish teachers like Jesus to discuss these kind of subjects in the open publicly, which is why this question is asked in a public setting. And I want you to see the reply that Jesus gives. First, he addresses himself to the Pharisees who asked this question, and then he begins to speak to his disciples, and he begins to talk about the kingdom in, in spiritual terms. So he speaks to the Pharisees, and then he kind of takes the subject of the kingdom, and he begins to talk about it in, in spiritual terms. I have three kind of main points or subjects or sections of this teaching today. The first section, if you would just say these words, their day. Everybody say their day. I want you to see, first of all, the kingdom contradiction. 
Luke 17, verse 20. Once on being asked by the Pharisees, here's the question, when will the kingdom of God come? So the first thing we need to ask is, what is the kingdom of God? Well, the kingdom of God is God's sphere or God's rule. It refers primarily to God's king, kingly power that's exercised over creation and over humanity. Psalm 22, verse 8, or 28, it says, For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nation. The kingdom of God is the sovereign rule of God that was initiated by Christ's earthly ministry, and, and we see that the kingdom of this world at one point will become the kingdom of the Lord. Revelation 11, chapter, or chapter 11, verse 15, it says, The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And we'll talk more about that portion of scripture in the coming weeks. And though rightfully under God's rule, what happened was fallen, sinful human beings, in essence, participated in what you could describe as a universal rebellion against God and his authority. You read about that in 1 John chapter 5. However, when you place your faith and obedience in Christ, men and women and children, we're now regenerated or we're made new by the Holy Spirit. We're reborn or born again and we become part of the kingdom. His kingdom is within us and it is now in operation. And so we talk about the participation of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not the church. There are some that will say the kingdom of God is the church or an earthly Christian institution. We see the value and we see the roles that the church and Christian institutions uh, play out in society to bring about good in our, in our society today. But that is not the kingdom. The true church is the body of Christ, which he is the head. And in Ephesians chapter 1, you read about that. But the kingdom of God refers to God's rule and his reign. And so the church exists, I believe, and you and I exist to demonstrate what a life is like under his reign, under his rulership. The main thrust of the kingdom of God, the main impact of the kingdom of God is the spiritual transformation that takes place in people's lives as they surrender to Jesus. And so the kingdom of God existed uh, before the beginning of the church, and it will continue after the work of the church is complete, though the church is part, for sure, of God's kingdom, but it is not all of, all of it. In the present age, the kingdom is most visibly at work through the church, through you and I as a believer, but it is not the whole. The kingdom is not a place that you go. You either live in it or you don't. Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God is not found in food or drink, but in righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy, Holy Spirit. So the kingdom of God is, is almost like it's a colony in the midst of a secular world in a secular society, and it demonstrates an alternative way of living. I don't believe that our purpose in life is to be called to kind of establish a theocracy where a few People claim to know the will of God and, and those select few begin to legislate morality on the rest of society. I believe our lives are to provoke a choice that your neighbor's gonna have to make, that your coworker's gonna have to make, that our lives is, are, are to provoke a choice to people in our world today, whether they're gonna live based on the principles and the values and the morals of this corrupt society in which we live, or are they gonna align their lives with God's kingdom? Are they gonna align their lives with the word of God as they surrender their lives to Jesus? So in Luke chapter two, Jesus is approached by the religionists, the Pharisees, and they're, he, they're asked this question. He, they ask him this question, when is the kingdom of God gonna come? Now, when I read the Bible, I'm a visual person, so I, I try to picture things. And, and when I see this question being asked to Jesus, this is not like a cute kind of dialogue, you know, Jesus, you know, how, how do you feel about the kingdom of God? When's the kingdom of God going to come? The, the wording that's used in the original language, this, this question is a hostile question. The Pharisees are basically coming to Jesus, and they're saying either put up or shut up. 
either produce the kingdom of the Messiah or stop claiming to be the Messiah. See, in Jesus' day, just like our own day, many people were longing for the the coming of the Messiah. The, The Pharisees knew all of the prophecies of the Old Testament, which spoke of the glory of this coming Messiah, and they wanted to live that kind of uh, life now on the earth. And so now Jesus is walking around and he's claiming to be the Messiah. He's, the kingdom of God is a, is a focus in his teaching and his preaching, and it's a focus in the conversations that are taking place. And by the time that Luke is written, rumors were already spread abroad that the, that the day of the Lord had already come. And so now they're asking this question, and we can see time and time again that the, the crowds and the, and the Pharisees are, are bringing up this subject of the kingdom. If you write down the reference in John chapter 6 verse, 15, or 6, verse 15, at one point there's a crowd of people that were attempting to try to force Jesus to establish the kind of kingdom that they wished to see. And so before this point, we see that the kingdom of God is unleashed we see it unleashed in power when, it, when Jesus is performing miracles and demons are being drived out and so forth. And you read in, that, in Luke chapter 11, verse 20. But now the religionists, the Pharisees of the day, are, are particularly interest, interested in two things related to the kingdom. And these two things are still prevalent when you look at religion today. Institutional religion, rules without relationship. It's a form of godliness that denies its power. So in them asking this question, they're looking at two specific things. First of all, they want to capitalize from the kingdom. And then secondly, they want to control the kingdom. The first in the area of capitalize, Jesus is preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And so they want to know, well, when's this coming? When's the great blessing for Israel coming? Because they know and they believe that they're going to be the beneficiaries of this kingdom. And so in them asking this question about the kingdom, it's provoking within their hearts their understanding and their false belief that they're going to capitalize from the benefits of the kingdom of God. They're not asking Jesus this question because they believe that this kingdom is going to impact people's lives They're not asking because they want to see more signs and wonders and miracles. They're asking because they simply want to capitalize from the benefits of their kingdom. They realized and they felt like they had a special place in this kingdom. Secondly, more than capitalizing, they wanted to control it. They had heard Jesus instruct his disciples, and we'll talk more about this in the coming weeks, to pray for the kingdom of God. And that must have sparked curiosity in their hearts. See, these leaders were so focused on being in charge, trying to control the things of the kingdom, trying to keep things done in in order and in decency and done properly according to their religious customs and their history and their traditions. So they're thinking, when is this kingdom going to come? Because we're in charge of this kingdom. We're going to control this kingdom. Jesus revealed how carnal and how erroneous their concepts of the kingdom were, especially the minds of the Pharisees. They had expected that the kingdom of God would would manifest in a political and revolutionary way, that the kingdom would overthrow the Roman government. They thought that this would be a sudden and a, a very visible thing that would take place in society, and now they would, you know, kind of attain the highest degree of earthly prosperity. They would enjoy being in charge and being in, uh, in, a, in a position of rulership and, and reigning. And so the Pharisees are asking this very selfish question, when is the kingdom going to come? And in Jesus' response, he in essence annihilates, you know, the expectations that they had of this glorious, magnificent you know, grandiose thing that was going to come where they were going to rule and reign in power. And he begins to talk about the kingdom, not in very visible ways, but he talks about it in spiritual terms, in a spiritual realm. And he's correcting their understanding of the kingdom that Rome would not necessarily be overturned. Israel would not necessarily be vindicated. An earthly kingdom wasn't going to be established at that point in time. Jesus is looking at them and he's in essence saying, I'm here. The kingdom has now arrived. 
And the mission is not to throw overthrow a political establishment, but the mission is something completely and drastically different than that which you've anticipated. I want to try to illustrate this to you. Um, a couple weeks ago, Ashley was traveling, and she was in Ohio, and in our bedroom at our new house, we had, when we bought the house, we had those really cheap blinds. Have you ever seen those that they block out like 1% of the sun? And so we got sheer curtains, you know, and so that we block out about 2% of the sun in our, in our room. And uh, recently we bought those darkening curtains. So when you close those things at night, I mean, you just, in, in the morning, you just don't see anything. I'm more of an early riser, and so I get up, and it's usually, you know, just pitch black in our room, and I kind of have a routine, and so the night before on my dresser, I put my jeans, my socks, my shirt, my watch, my glasses, they're just all kind of like stacked. So in total darkness every day, I can get up, and get my stuff, and get out, and get on with my day. And uh, Ashley was in Ohio for a couple of days, and Aisling got up in the middle of the night, and I brought her uh, over, and she was sleeping in, uh, in our bed. And I got up like I do, you know, in the mornings, and I go to grab my stuff in total darkness, try not to wake Aislinn. And as I grab the pile, the glasses are not on the pile, and I, I can just tell. Do you ever get frustrated with yourself? You ever just like, you ever get frustrated to the self that it's yourself that it's like you're just incredibly irritated you know i'm looking in total darkness trying to feel around everywhere for my glasses i'm trying to feel between the clothes i'm trying to feel on the dresser i kind of stumble across the room in total darkness you know i'm doing this whole thing because if i turn on the light she's waking up and then it kind of throws off the the rhythm so anyway I, I i get to the point that i'm like just really frustrated i'm like fine i'll turn the light on and I turn the light on, and I'm wearing the glasses. <laughs> and I'm thinking, here I am spending all of this time trying to focus on that which is right in front of me. Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, he's saying, you're looking for this kingdom. And I'm standing right before your very eyes, and you're completely oblivious to this reality it's the kingdom contradiction and so jesus is now addressing and he's saying you're blinded to the reality this religious prejudice you have you're totally missing the mark that the kingdom is right here in your midst you want to capitalize it you want to control it you you've got this whole kind of religious thing packaged together in your system. You've got your beliefs, you've got your customs, you've got your code of conduct, your laws for every occasion. You're trying to kind of take this kingdom of God and fit it into your religious thing. And he's saying you don't even recognize the reality that the kingdom is right in front of you. This is interesting to me because as I really think about the subject of the kingdom, I think a lot of Christians are really intrigued about studying the kingdom in the Bible, being prepared for the kingdom that's coming one day, but they miss the reality of the kingdom today. I don't want to necessarily focus and spend my whole life being intrigued at this kingdom that, that used to exist or it's in the pages of Scripture. Live my life so I'm prepared that one day I'm not going to miss it. No, I want to live a kingdom mentality today. So here's the question you'll see on the screen. Is the kingdom of God a future reality to be hoped for or a present reality to experience now? And the question is, yes. The kingdom of God is a future reality to be hoped for, but the kingdom of God is a present reality to experience now. If you don't get both of these things in your spirit, you'll live your life hoping that one day, and you'll completely miss today. Flip that side of the coin if you see the kingdom of God as this big thing today, you'll live and treat this life if it's the only heaven you're ever going to know. And you don't wake up with that anticipation that one day, that one day Jesus will. We, we have to have both of these things. 
at the same time. The kingdom contradiction. But let's talk about the present, present reality of the kingdom that we're to experience in our day. As in right now, as in this afternoon, as in this week. Verse 20 through 21, the kingdom of God is not something to be observed, nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. The word that's used here for observed, it goes against absolutely everything that you and I would associate with what we would say is an earthly or worldly kingdom. Earthly and worldly kingdoms that are established in our day are typically linked to human ability and visibility. Earlier this year, I had the chance as we were in Ohio, we, we uh, were right around the corner from LeBron James' home. And a friend of ours that we were with said, well, let's go to the LeBron James' home. I thought, well, it's not often that you get to see, you know, a $10 million plus dollar house. So we kind of take two turns and it's in the middle of like this average state college neighborhood. And all of the sudden you pull up to this massive property. The home on the right was for sale. I'm thinking, yeah, of course it would be for sale. But this huge estate. I mean, you can't, you can't get anywhere near the house. There's security things in front. There are big gates. I mean, it's, a, it, it, it's what people would say is an earthly kingdom. It represents wealth. It represents human ability and visibility. And yet when Jesus says, and he begins to talk about this word, he says it cannot be observed. Everybody say observed. Jesus says my kingdom is not going to look like any form or shape of what you would look and associate as a kingdom in this world, the word observed is used in kind of two different ways. The, the first way is the idea of a doctor watching a patient for symptoms to appear. So he's observing the patient so that he can pinpoint a diagnosis or an illness or a disease. Jesus says you're not going to be able to pinpoint, you're not going to be able to observe outside of relationship with Christ, my kingdom. The second word would mean careful observation. It's used in astronomy. So this would be where you watch the course of a planet and you plot kind of the trajectory of a comet and so forth so that you can focus or forecast where it would be at a certain time. Jesus says you're not going to be able to observe outside of relationship with Christ, my kingdom, like a doctor looking at the symptoms of a patient, nor are you going to be able to look out to the sky and observe and plan and plot exactly what my kingdom looks like. Which means many things that you and I need to realize. Because what Jesus is doing, he's looking the Pharisees in the eyes and he's saying, the things of my kingdom will not, they cannot, nor will they ever be able to be figured out by human intellect and understanding alone. You must have the spirit of God that is active and in you as a believer to bring about wisdom and supernatural understanding to the kingdom. Outside of somebody being in relationship with Christ, they cannot observe it, they cannot see it, and it certainly can't be understood by human logic and understanding. Jesus says it's not going to be this dramatic kind of thunderous show where all of a sudden, you know, men are going to say, well, there's the kingdom or here's the kingdom because that's what it looks like and that's what I've studied and I've tried to figure this whole thing out. It's as almost as if there's this silent, pervasive influence that is an internal thing that takes place within the life of a believer. It's not flashy. It's not showy. And you certainly can't enter it on your own. How can someone be born when they're old, Nicodemus said. Surely they can't enter a second time into the mother's womb to be born, Jesus says. Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and of the spirit. It's a spiritual thing. So you might as well look and perceive and come to the realization that the things of the kingdom are not going to be understood by people that do not have relationship with Christ. So it's a reality for today. You can't see it with the naked eye. Somebody that's not a believer can look everywhere trying to find the kingdom of God and it will always 
be in a future tense because they cannot see it today. John chapter 3, 3 through 5, very truly, Jesus says, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. So it's not like the, the kingdoms of this world. It's not a, a physical or material dimension. It's not the kind of kingdoms that we see when we look at nations around the world and, and leaders around the world and so forth. The focus is not about time nor location, but Jesus, the life and ministry of Jesus, he now brings about the kingdom. He became a human being to usher in the kingdom of God and providing a way for us to be restored in right relationship with God. This goes all the way back to what the angel said to Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 31. She said, the Lord God will give him a throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And yet Jesus, as you study the Bible, does not do a whole lot to define the kingdom of God. He certainly describes it with parables. He teaches on kingdom principles, and we'll talk about those in the coming weeks. But he do, we do see him demonstrating the kingdom in its presence and his power through his earthly ministry as a template to say, this is what everyday kingdom living looks like. But he doesn't give us, you know, these are the, the ten keys of the kingdom, and these are the ten things to look for. And if you could read it, then really you wouldn't need to be in right relationship with him to see it. The word that's used in the King James translation of the Bible, it says that the kingdom of God is within you. Other translations say it's among you or it's in your midst. And so Jesus is saying that he is the embodiment of the kingdom. And he's setting up the kingdom of God there and then. And God is beginning his rule and reign as he continually touches men and women and children's lives. It's within us. It's within us. Where is the kingdom of God? Well, it's in, within the hearts of the people who have been restored back to God. It's a spiritual thing that's taking place. See, you've got to, for me, I believe that the kingdom of God is within us as a Christian. You've got to begin to realize that God's kingdom is within you. But you also have to read scripture through the lens of, of the context in which Jesus is writing it, because Jesus could hardly look the Pharisees, most of whom were basically interrogating him, they were unbelievers, Jesus could never say that the kingdom of God is within you. So he says it's in your, it's in your midst, it's in your presence. The kingdom, which is the rule and reign of God, is within our hearts as believers in Christ. We see the same word that's used later, we see it in Matthew that shows the contrast with the Pharisees in Matthew 3, 26, or 23, 26. He says, blind Pharisees, first you clean the inside, or the Greek word, the, in the midst, it's the same word. He says to the Pharisees, you clean the inside of the cup or the dish, and then you also, and, and then the outside also will be clean. So this word he's, he uses in the, in the Bible to describe the filth and that corruption that's within the hearts of the Pharisees, but he also says that the kingdom is now within the hearts of the believers in this atmosphere of hostility and, and, and uh, scrutiny as they're looking at Jesus' life trying to figure out exactly about this whole kingdom thing. Jack Hayford writes this. He says, foundational to the New Testament truth is that the kingdom of God is a spiritual reality and dynamic available to each person who receives Jesus as Savior and Lord. The significance of this is that it signals a restoration, a wonderful potential for each believer, reinstating something of rulership or dominion originally intended for human mankind. The idea is that when this restoration takes place in the life of a believer, that the things that, that were under the curse of the law that had been stolen to you are now brought back to you. And you can read about this later in, or earlier in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. The Apostle Paul talks in Romans chapter 5, describing reigning in life through Christ Jesus. And it's only possible as you and I continue to walk in a surrendered 
life to Christ as we abide in him. We depend on him for his power and his grace. And we walk and we continually walk in the Holy Spirit. But the full reconciliation or the return to the Father and the restoration are now possible as we keep in step with the Spirit. The Spirit is within us and the kingdom is within us. And we'll talk more in the coming weeks about kingdom principles. But you've got to look at this in contrast to worldly, worldly kingdoms that we know of. See, worldly kingdoms are ruled by imperfect men. The kingdom of God is ruled by the king of kings, the Lord of lords, who says, not follow us. That's light years from what he said. He said, follow me. Worldly kingdoms are restricted by geographical Boundaries, political partisanship, part, partisanship, cultural norms, ethnicity, economies, and language. And yet the kingdom of God is not limited by any of those things. Look at authority in worldly kingdoms. It's most often centralized to a small group of wealthy and influential people. And yet in God's kingdom, it operates on the principle that all men and women carry equal weight with God. And in fact, he strictly warns against corrupting influences of wealth and power to a few select celebrity kingdom leaders. The kingdom of this world is ruled exclusively by the top down, where leadership accrues power and the strong continually oppress and control and manipulate the weak. These type of kingdoms are detestable to Jesus. He has nothing good to say about them. In fact, he goes on to say that the greatest in the kingdom of God is the one that takes not the, the role of rulership, but the one that serves. Kingdom authority, Jesus taught, leads from the bottom up. Not a pyramid, but if you were to take that pyramid and you flip, kingdom leadership serves its way to greatness, in essence, is what Jesus said. His kingdom is so contradictory to the kingdoms of this world. The kingdom of God functions, uh, the kingdom of God functions by rules that are upside down and often impure, incredibly impractical. A casual commitment to a worldly system is acceptable and commonly viewed as prudent. Yet the kingdom of God is an all-in or all-out arrangement. It's a matter of life. So this kingdom that Jesus establishes is so drastically different than the kingdoms of this world. A great preacher many years ago said this. He said, someone asked me to define where the kingdom of heaven is. If you ask me, I'll tell you. Show me the man who is just, honest, who is benevolent, who is charitable and loves God and loves his fellow men. Show me such a man, bring him to me, stand him by my side, and I care not what color of his skin, nor his name, nor his nation, nor his social standing or financial position, or what would be his degree of intellectual development. I will point my finger at that man's chest, and I will say, there within the chest of that man is the kingdom of heaven. He said, you ask where the kingdom of heaven is. He said, bring me a woman who is pure and affectionate and loyal in her sense of duty, that is sympathetic and charitable of speech, that is patient, full of love for the divine being and for those of her race of whom she was brought in contact. Yea, bring that woman and stand her by my side. I care not whether she's Caucasian or African, whether she be of this nation or that. I care nothing about her intellectual development. I will tell you that the kingdom of heaven is within that woman's soul. He says, within such a man, within such a woman is the kingdom boundless in extent, perpetual in its expression of power, majestic in its appearance, persisting in its energy, divine in its quality, a kingdom of which there can be only one king that is God, a kingdom for which the sovereignty of which there is one uh, being fitted in infinite spirit. And this, as I understand, is the glory of the man and the glory of the woman 
that within them there is this realm of capacity, of faculty, of sense, of aspiration, of sentiment, of feeling so fine, so pure, so noble, so majestic and holy that its natural king is infinite love. It was introduced to himself in this realm to establish his throne and possess it in this kingdom that Jesus, the son of God, the son of man came and he is over the kingdom within. He reigns and if he reigns at all. It is within this kingdom that he energizes. It is out of this kingdom that his glory has to proceed. Not in that which is nominal or technical. Not in which is verbal or formal. Not in which is in accordance with customs and tradition. The Savior is present. It's a present reality for today. So that was talking about the kingdom contradiction in their day. The reality of the kingdom in our day, but then the future reality of the kingdom for which we hope for one day. Verse 22 through 24. Speaking of the coming kingdom and king. He says to his disciples, a time is coming when you will long to see of the days of the son of man, but you will not see it. People will tell you there it is or here it is. Don't go running after them. For the son of man is is in his day will be like lightning which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to another. And so now Jesus moves from kind of this internal manifestation of the kingdom within the hearts of believers and he begins to associate the kingdom with his earthly return. He says that it's here within us as as believers, and many of the blessings that we experience as part of the kingdom are here and now, but they'll ultimately find fulfillment one day when he returns. The second coming of Christ, which includes the rapture of the church, but it is also followed by the visible return of Christ, and his saints will reign on the earth, the Bible says, for a thousand years. Now, here's the thing with end times prophecy. Uh, For me personally, I am not Uh, one that gets kind of wrapped up in so many of the dogmatic views where people really try to narrow down and and, kind of split hairs on end times prophecy and theology. Because a lot of times, um, you know, I can see where people would make arguments for a variety of different things. And a lot of times what happens is the intent with the scrutiny and trying to figure out end times prophecy, and some of us were uh, a group of guys were getting together for lunch uh, recently. We were talking about this. And so many times with end times prophecy, so many people, they get so wrapped up on end times theology that they miss the kingdom of God that's like here and what you and I are supposed to do today. We believe that the kingdom is active in our lives, that one day he will return. But the Bible says no one will know the day nor the hour. And yet so many people are trying to figure out the day. In the hour. And yet, what does that have to do with what God has called us to do today? But the Bible says that one day that kingdom will be established. And yet, so much of what you and I are to focus on is what are we to do today? My second coming will will come. Jesus is, in essence, saying this is what it's going to look like, and you can read through later on in that chapter, but it's almost as if he's saying, don't worry about that. Don't try to figure it out. Don't spend your time and your energy and your emotion figuring out the coming kingdom. He, in essence, says, one day it's going to come, and trust me, you're going to know. You're not going to be standing around trying to figure out what exactly is going on. He says, you know what? It's pretty clear. He said, it's pretty clear on what it's going to look like when my kingdom comes. I remember as a kid, you know, we used to teach. A lot of times teachers would teach, you know, Johnny and Susie are going to be sitting on the swing set. Johnny's gone. Susie's left behind. Don't be left behind. (laughs) And there's just so much focus on, you know, two people are walking down the street. They're married. One's in right relationship with the Lord, the other's not. And all of a sudden, there's one empty hand walking down the street. You better be ready for the... And it's like the... so. It seemed like the focus, the emphasis was like, don't miss that kingdom. And yet I'm saying on an intellectual level, so many believers 
understand and they love to study the kingdom and what it looked like through the life of Jesus. And we're hoping that one day we don't miss it. And yet, before our very eyes, the king, things of the kingdom are to be in operation today. Jesus says there'll be unmistakable signs in chapter 17 that will immediately precede the, the, and accompany his future return. He'll shortly indicate by a parable in chapter 19, verse 11, the full expression of the kingdom. For me personally, I am much more focused on what does the Lord want for me today. But here's the thing. God rules wherever he's welcomed as king. God rules and he reigns wherever he's welcomed as king. Is he king in your life? Does he rule and does he reign and is he in charge of his church or this church? I don't want to develop a, a Pharisee spirit that says I want the kingdom to be something that I, that I experience so that I can control it, so I can benefit. I want the kingdom to come. I want to grow in my understanding of the kingdom because I want him to increase his rule and his reign in my life. That's why I talk so much about it's not in trying harder. It's in about surrendering more and more and more to the Lord's rulership and his reign in our lives. As the worship team comes back. Is he your king? Would you close your eyes for a minute before we come to a close this morning? Maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. You've never surrendered your life to him. You've never made him Lord of your life. You've never come to the point where you acknowledge that you are someone that's a sinner in need of a savior. And when you look at the, your life, the passions and the motivations of your heart, They're centered around earthly kingdoms. It's all about what can I do for me? What can I receive for me? What can I do to benefit myself? And you've never come to the place that you realize that you need Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You say, well, what's the magic prayer? There's no magic prayer. But there are three questions. Do you believe that Jesus is Lord? Do you believe that he's Lord? Not a prophet, not a teacher, not just a good historical figure, but he's Lord of all. Absolutely, totally in charge. That he is, like he said, the, one, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Do you believe that he's Lord? Secondly, do you believe God rose him from the dead? Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead, that he is alive? Question number three. Not just do you believe Jesus is Lord, not just do you believe Jesus rose from the dead. Do you repent of your sin? Sin is missing the mark. It's living a life that doesn't meet God's standard, which is in his word. All of us have missed the mark. But do you repent of your sin? Do you realize that you must have a restoration that takes place within your life so that you can stand before God and be in right relationship with him? If sin separates, then what's the solution to restore me in right relationship with God? Well, it's Jesus. The Bible says that he became sin for us so that you and I can become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And today, you want to surrender your life to Jesus. You, want to, you believe that he's Lord. You believe that he rose from the dead. You repent of your sin. Repentance means you, you want to change. It's not just, I'm sorry, I've messed up. I mean, we all have messed up. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. 
but that you reject a life of sin and you turn your back on that life of sin and you turn towards Christ. And in turning towards Christ, you're born again. You are made alive. It's not Jesus taking a good person and making him a, a great person. It's Jesus taking someone who was dead in sin, making them alive in Christ. And you become part of his kingdom. It's within you. It's in operation around us. And you want to surrender your life to Jesus. I want to pray for you this morning before we move on to an application point or two. But if that's you, would you just raise your hand? I'll pray for you right where you're at in your seat today. I see your hands in the back. Anybody else? Yeah, just raise them up. Yeah. Would you just, as you're seated today, just acknowledge that your need for Jesus. Tell them, say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you rose from the dead. I turn my back on sin. And I receive your grace and your mercy. I receive your love. And it's in these moments that the Holy Spirit of God restores you into right relationship with Jesus. If you had a jump drive in your computer and you drag the sin from your jump drive into the trash can on the computer, but you leave it there. In essence, it's been removed, but it hasn't been totally deleted. That's not what happens when you're saved. Every once in a while, I go onto my computer and I empty the trash. And it's in that moment that the files that were once on my computer, if those files represented sin, when you empty the trash, they're gone. You can't recover those. Unless you work for the government. But I can't recover those, right? And so when you're saved, your sin is not just simply moved to a holding place, but it's, it's been deleted once and for all. That you leave these doors today in your acknowledgement that Jesus is Lord, believing that he rose from the dead and repenting of your sin. You walk out of these doors today completely made right with God. It's a wonderful reality for those of you that raised your hand. And our heart as a church is to partner with you because salvation is not an, an ending point for sure. It's a starting point. And you'll continually grow in your relationship with God. And he'll bless you beyond measure. This room is filled with people that have walked with Jesus for many years through trials, through difficulties and their faith is more alive and stronger than ever before as everybody else stands today God rules where he's welcome as king my heart for you if, as a pastor is that not that you're at home so intrigued about the things of the kingdom on an intellectual level. Not that you wake up in the morning and you say, come Lord Jesus today. Both of those things that are, are appropriate. But for me, my heart is your pastor is that you wake up and say, Jesus, the things of the kingdom are for me today. I look at Jesus' life that models what kingdom now living looks like I hope for its fulfillment one day but I don't want to miss today and yet that's a challenge for us you know why because it impacts how you treat your neighbor it impacts how you live a life at home it impacts the things that are around us each and every day of our lives but God's best for you is to have a kingdom first mentality what does that look like you walk into a doctor's office and he says, you have cancer. What's the first thing that hits your mind? Is it a kingdom mentality? Jesus is my healer though. I live by faith and not by sight. Has it so ingrained you that the first thought, the first word that you speak is a kingdom-minded word. It's a kingdom-minded thought. You pull out of the parking lot today somebody cuts you off on the road 
What's the first thought there? I'm telling you, this is where the rubber meets the road. Is it a kingdom-minded heart? Jesus, bless them as I trail them now. Yeah. It's where the rubber meets the road. Lord, we come to you today. We need your help, Lord. Lord, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by your spirit that's working in our lives. Jesus, I pray this week would be a kingdom-minded week. In every way, shape, or form, that we would see people through kingdom eyes. That we would see them not as black or white, male or female, rich or poor, but we would see them as spiritually lost or in right relationship with Christ. Lord, as we look at our bank accounts, Lord, I pray we wouldn't look at them through the lens of dollars and cents, but we would look at them through the lens of my God shall meet all my needs according to his riches and glory. In every way, Lord, help us to live a kingdom-minded mentality. We're gonna close today by singing a song that Aaron and the team is gonna lead us. And then I'll pray just a prayer of benediction today as we leave today. Let's sing this together. Jesus, God's righteousness The Son of Man, man, the Son of God, His kingdom comes. Jesus, redemption, sacrifice. Now glorified, now justified, his kingdom comes. And this kingdom will no go end, and its glory shall not.
pray for each person that's here today. Lord, that we would live a kingdom first mindset. Lord, that you would increase in our lives love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Lord, that we would surrender and walk in a dimension of surrender that literally provokes people to make a decision to turn towards Christ and continue living after the kingdoms of this world. Pray your blessing upon each family that's here today, each college student, each teenager, each child. Lord, we thank you for your presence that's within us, that we carry that each and every place we go. I pray your blessing upon each person this week as they live a kingdom first mentality. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a great week. Look forward to being back together next weekend. 